Great. So good afternoon, everybody. As uh, Yadiel just said, my name is Tim Vincent. And in this particular uh, day, I'm working as a consultant. And I'm going to be speaking about cultural humility and health disparities and racial bias related to COVID-19. Um, it's been uh, an important aspect of my work to really think about health equity uh, in a variety of places and settings and um, concerns that people have around health. And so that's something that I've been doing for quite a long time. And this particular time that we're living in with COVID-19 and really uh, amplified, I would say, awareness of systemic racis racism and structural racism has really been um, and it impacted me, but it's impacted, I think, all of us and all of our communities and the work that we do. And so I want to take this time that we have together to talk about um, the relationship that race has with the disparities that we're seeing right now and thinking about ways in which we can change some of those dynamics in um, the work that we do. And so that's what we're going to be doing today. Thank you all for coming. You know, I want to give you one real quick thing before we really get going, because I know you were told to turn off your uh, videos, but could you turn on your videos just for a moment, because I want to see who's here. Who's here? I want to look at, I want to look at your faces and see who's here and see the, the beautiful group that we have here with us today. So wave, do something, give us some idea that you're really with us. Yes, yes. And I know that sometimes this is hard because we're in this virtual world where we're not really getting to connect like we do, but we're gonna have a chance to do some small breakouts and I really want you to participate in them, to speak to the, your colleagues, to really think about, um, I think this really important and just in some ways a difficult conversation that we're continuing to have and really looking at. Um, so I want you to be with us as much as you can. And so if you, you can turn your cameras off if you don't, or you can keep them on, but I just wanted to see you first before we started. So here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna talk about, um, I'm gonna present some data on some of the current disparities related to COVID-19. I'm gonna talk about some of the inequities that are responsible for some of the disparities that we're seeing uh, here in, uh, now, here in uh, well there in Alameda County and also in California just specifically. I'm going to talk about the uh, impact that structural racism has on disparities uh, related to COVID-19. And we're going to talk about the principles and the approach of cultural humility as a way to build on our response to the inequities that we're seeing. So that's where we're going. And let's get going. So just to set the, uh, you know, the context here, you know, we are, you know, in this unprecedented situation where we're still dealing with and really grappling with the COVID-19 pandemic. We're seeing rising numbers in many places and just really some, just concerned about how we're really gonna get through all of this. Um, we have continual recognition of the disparities among population, uh, particular population groups around the country, but also in Alameda County and in California. There's still concerns about testing capabilities and how people even can get that information and get um, to really protect themselves and to be as safe as possible. We're concerned that the recommended strategies that are really available for people around flattening the curve or not being adhered to or don't work for different groups of people for a variety of reasons. And then, you know, I know that everybody's been very um, aware of the um, significance of the Black Lives Matters movement and the consciousness that has been amplified around structural racism and how it really impacts um, really uh, so many institutions, but and how it really relates to our response to COVID-19. So here's just some brief statistics about what's going on right now. And as I'm talking about these particular statistics, I want you to think about what you believe might be some of the underlying causes, some of the reasons why some of the disparities are existing or in some of the inequities are happening uh, with regard to COVID-19. So in Alameda County, this was actually a couple of days ago, so it's actually changed, but there's 9,256 cases uh, reported in Alameda County and 162 deaths related to COVID-19. Um, if you look at, there's different ways of looking at this, but if you look at rates um, K 
case rates per 100,000 uh, people in the population by race and ethnicity. Uh, I think you can see this, but the bar is um, definitely disproportionate around people who would identify with either Hispanic, Latino, Latinx communities, way off the chart with regard to the amount of cases versus the amount of population of people in Alameda County. So again, I want to think a little bit about, I want you to think a little bit about what that might mean and how that <clears throat> has come to be. Um, and then, you know, there are other uh, groups that also show some disparities with regard to, to case rates and some concerns with case rates, but not nearly as significant, you know, with regard to case rates as, as Hispanic Latino population. Um, so that's, that's one way of looking at what's happening. And I want you to think a little bit about that. And then I'm going to um, launch a poll. So here's, here's the poll that I want you to ask. I just talked about case rates, uh, which has to do with that, but we're talking now I'm talking about death rates. So I want you to think about what, what you know or what you believe. What, what, what group would you think would have the highest death rates uh, related to COVID-19? And so I want you to vote right now. Let me know what you believe or what you think. So I'm going to give it a couple of seconds. So I just want you to press which one you believe that <clears throat> has the highest death rates with regard to COVID-19. Okay, I'm going to end this poll and I'm going to share the results right now. So most of you said uh, Black, African-American, uh, and then that was followed by Latino. Um, and actually that is true. And I'm going to sh now stop sharing and move to the next slide, which um, shows you this. So this is a different way of looking at it. This is the total death rates per 100,000 uh, population. And there's better data, as you can probably imagine, it makes some sense, around death rates than there would be around case rates, because I think that, you know, it, when people are, you know, have a, are dying and there's a much more clear way in which we can get um, information about their race, ethnicity, and other, and other aspects of their identity. But so when you're looking at death rates, it's also predominantly and disproportionately represented by Black people, African American people, then followed by Hispanic and Latino. And then again, um, there's the other uh, groups are listed here in uh, smaller proportions. Um, so again, death rates are different. So again, think a little bit about what you might think has a, a way of explaining that disparity. And then this is also interesting. This is from the California Department of Public Health. This is for the state of California. And it shows you um, numbers of cases, the percent of the cases, it tells you the number of deaths and the percent of deaths. But the interesting thing for me to look at, because it's a lot here, but the interesting thing for me to look at is the last thing it tells you the percentage of the population in California. And you can kind of compare that with the, um, either the percentage of cases or the percentage of deaths. So if you look at like the first line with Latinos, if you're looking at the percentage of cases is 53.7, but the percentage of the population is 36.3, definitely tells you that there's a significant disparity in the um, representation of people who uh, are COVID-19 positive who uh, would be in that category of Latino. And also when you look at death rates, the death rates are also higher than the population rates. And then if you follow it down to uh, African American, which is the fourth um, line down, you'd see that, you know, with regard to percentage of deaths, you know, which is the uh, one, two, three, four, fifth uh, column to the right, percentage of deaths is 8.8 .8, and the percentage of the population is 6.1. So that's a significant percentage of uh, disparity that's around death rates. That also happens with Native Americans, if you can follow that down a bit. That also is happening with Pacific Islanders. It's also happening with other groups that may not have as, as large population, but the significant difference in the population that's represented, and then the people who are dying of COVID or the number of cases, it shows a, a significant disparity with regard to those groups of people. And so this is a, you know, a, a lot of content here, but I wanna just tell you that the picture here for California uh, in terms of really looking at equity is to really look at the second line says that health outcomes are affected by forces, including structural racism, poverty, and a disproportionate prevalence of underlying conditions. 
for Latinos, for African Americans, and only by looking at a full picture can we understand what the best outcomes will be for everybody. And I know that, that it, you're here because you are very much uh, compassionate about helping the communities that you serve. If you look at the second, the second part, it really, again, just tells you that the differences in outcomes are most stark by um, COVID-19 deaths rates. And because we nearly have complete data on that. And the trends are showing that, you know, for Latinos, African Americans, Native Hawaiians, Pacific Islanders are dying at disproportionately high levels. Um, and again, it lets you know that uh, the proportion of COVID-19 deaths for African Americans is about one and a half times the population representation for Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders, although the numbers are low, there's a double difference between deaths and the population representation. So again, it gives you a picture of the disparity. So I'm gonna ask you to, we're gonna do our first uh, breakout. We're gonna meet some of the people that are in this, uh, at this presentation. And I want you to, in your groups, you're gonna be talking about, in hearing some of what I just described and also what you know, what would you think are some of the explanations that are the underlying or the understanding uh, of this current data related to COVID-19 and disparities? And what are the factors and how are these factors that you're thinking about, how do, they, how do they create disparity? So if you're thinking about a particular thing, how does it create it so that a person is either more vulnerable or, or getting infected or, or is dying at a higher rate? So I want you to talk about that. You're gonna have about maybe eight to 10 minutes to do that. You're, each of the groups is gonna have a, a moderator or a leader and they know who they are. So they're gonna introduce themselves to you when you go to the breakout rooms. Welcome back, hello, hello. So in chat, just tell me like a word. Was it good? How was the conversation? Good, interesting, challenging. Write a word. Give me a, give me a. Too short. We, too short, yeah. Short, too short. You want not enough time, quick. You know, I said we could have a two hour Zoom. No, I'm just joking. Quick, what are, anything else? Good, not enough time, great. Great, a bit abrupt ending. Oh, it was just getting good, just getting good. We're gonna have another one though, so don't worry, you're gonna have another chant. Just getting good, great insights. All right, well, that's wonderful to hear. So, Diana, you with us? Yes. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. Okay. We're gonna see some of the, oh, wow, and can you, wow, this is exciting, woo. Wow, and is there a way to make that a little bit larger so we can see the... All right. <laughs> this is cool. Isn't this a cool feature? I'm just excited. I'm excited about it too. So this is great. So we got to see some of the things that, yeah, people saying stuff like people don't have a, uh, in the person who was in yellow group, I think it was group one, a hard time. All right, you're adding some more things. That's so great. Socioeconomic status is a social determinant. Hard time getting people to utilize masks, follow safety measures, underlying issues, conditions. People don't have the option to self-isolate because there's not enough space. Being surrounded by others is a good thing, but it creates a challenge when you can't do that. Wow, that's great. Can you show me that? Oh, yeah, that would be great. Can you make that a little bit bigger? That yellow one, yeah. People who don't have access to a computer and apply for benefits online, have to go in person. People are handling their business. They don't have equal access. Great, these are great things. Maybe we can highlight something from the green. Can we do that? Because this, you wrote such great things. Serious lack of understanding of COVID-19. Don't see themselves as part of the group. Lack of trust of the system, lack of awareness, a big gap between those who have the information and can and that can be filled by just a few service providers. Let's see what the blue said. Just get a blue one, that would be great. A couple of blue ones. System designed not to serve black and brown communities, institutionalized racism. Somebody wrote another blue one, maybe, Diane, if you can, that'd be great. Implicit bias in health providers, great, who do not believe that the client is reporting providers making assumptions based in, in racism, right? Let's see, is there some in, oh yeah, it's good. Systematic flaws in system minorities uh, making up higher percentage of jobs that are at risk of exposure. Yeah, so the, there's many people who are more exposed to uh, COVID-19 who represent black and brown communities and other communities of color. Um, 
Maybe we can see a couple of the orange ones. That would be great. Uh, certain groups, people of color are more like, ooh, whoops, I'm sorry, I missed that one. Um, yeah, certain groups, people of color are more likely to be essential workers who have to go to work, grocery stores, restaurants, migrant workers are not able to socially distance. Maybe another orange one, that'd be great. Uh, misinformation on social media, politics, fake news, jokes about the president, people are ignoring it. Households are more tight knit, more likely to be multi-generational. Poverty, lack of resources, racism contributes to the death rates. It relates to zip code. Doctors can have implicit bias. This is great. You guys have such really great thoughts around this. And I know that maybe not everybody got to go to the jam board. So this, this is incredible. Is there a way also, because I'm, I'm, this is somewhat new to me, so I'm excited about this, uh, Diana and Yadiel. Is there a way, can we like, take a picture of that and then, you know, and see all of them? Or how does that, can that happen? If it can't, that's okay. But if it can, it'd be great to, for everybody to see this and share this because these are great thoughts that people have around what we might want to be doing and changing uh, when we're thinking about how to create more uh, equity or an anti-racist um, approach to COVID-19. So if that happens, great. If it can't, that's great. But yeah, thank you. I can you. make a document for folks. And so okay, great. You can make a document for them. Thank you. Anybody who wants, to, you can also, if we have just a minute or two, because I know that every group got to do it. Maybe it was just hard with the Jamboard. But is there anybody else who wanted to make sure that they, their comment was heard? You can put yourself off mute and let us know what your thoughts were or what your group's thoughts were, especially group four. I don't think I saw anything from them. Was anybody the pink people, pink, pink group? No pressure, if not. Um, thank you, Diana, for doing that. I'm going to share my screen again. If you can let me do that, that would be great. And uh, we're seeing my slides right now, yes? Yes. Yes? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. All right, so I'm going to move forward then. So thank you for all of that. I'm going to talk a bit about racism. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the connections that it has. I think people mentioned that, and they mentioned some of some of the connections that racism already has to uh, medical services provision and and what happens to people who are being asked to work uh, and put themselves at risk and how that is connected to racism. Um, I've been uh, I know that there's been a lot in the news lately about uh, systemic racism and institutional racism, and there's been a lot of uh, leading thinkers who've been talking about this for a long time. So I wanted to look at, at some of them and, and think about what they, uh, how they see this. So I'm just letting you know that some of the stuff that I'm talking about in the next uh, maybe 10 minutes or so comes from Dr. Kamara Jones, who is, was the past president of the uh, American Public Health Association um, and is an MD. Um, I think that many people may know this, but I'm in, in it right now, the book, How to Be an Anti-Racist by Ibram Kendi, who uh, was a professor and also a, an author. And then uh, Dr. Darnisa Armante Jackson has a uh, group called Dig Deep for Equity. I'm giving you the um, web link, but she does incredibly interesting work around um, health equity. Uh, Resma Menachem, uh, you might know, also has a book called My Grandmother's Hands. He is a therapist, so his contribution to this is, is different in many ways. It's really about uh, how we store trauma in our bodies, racist trauma in our bodies, and the, the way to heal it is really through um, body work and not just mind work. And then uh, this came from uh, Jadon's suggestion, which is great. There's a really good uh, website called Dismantling Racism that also has a lot of really good um, tools and some videos and things to really look at. But I've been looking at all of those because I wanna, again, make this connection uh, between what's, what we're doing, what's happening right now, and and racism. So people talk about racism in different ways. This is from Kamara Jones, uh, who was a thinker and still is a thinker about this, but really started this a long time ago. Her uh, definition is that racism is a system of structuring opportunity and assigning value based on the social interpretation of how one looks, which we call race, that unfair, unfairly disadvantages some individuals in community, unfairly advantages other individuals in community, and saps the strength of the entire society uh, through a waste of human resources. So that's her definition of 
racism. It, people talk about it happening on, many of the people talk about it happening on different levels. They're talking about it can be an individual level, uh, an interpersonal level. So individual racism can be someone's racist assumptions, their beliefs, their behaviors. They can be conscious, they can be unconscious. Interpersonal racism happens when uh, we bring those beliefs into the interactions we have with other people. It can also be internalized. We take what we hear, we've, we put them on ourselves. I may have some lack in my own beliefs about my ability that's based in things that I've heard. And again, that also comes from a cultural level of racism, the, the values, the prevailing norms that have been set up that um, disadvantage particular people and advantage other people uh, and their worth. Institutional racism has to do with the ways in which institutions and policies and practices uh, offer different outcomes for different racial groups. Um, it could be governmental organizations, education, courts of law um, that routinely disadvantage people of color. Uh, and then structural has to do with all of the ways in which everything that I just said interplays and creates a, a really a system of unequal opportunity based on race. And so it, it can be very um, complicated, I think, to have uh, a keen awareness of the ways in which all of those levels of racism impact you know, what I do, what I can do, what our communities can do or can't do. So here's another way of looking at structural racism, which is really about uh, of what I just said, an array of the dynamics that can be rooted in history uh, culture, institution, and interpersonal, and routinely advantage uh, white people versus uh, the communities of color and have a chronic advantage, uh, adverse outcomes on people of color. Uh, it's a system of hierarchy and inequity that is characterized by white supremacy, really meaning not uh, uh, radical groups, but meaning uh, valuing whiteness and having that be uh, the thing that uh, the standard in which uh, other people are um, measured by and a preferential treatment and privilege and the, of the power of white people at the expense of black, Latino, Latinx, Asian, Pacific Islander, Native American, Arab, and other racially oppressed people. I'm not gonna show this video. I was gonna show you a video in a moment, but I think I'm gonna skip that for right now and move on to this next thing. The other thing that I think is really interesting, again, I don't know if you're reading this, but in the book, uh, How to Be an Anti-Racist, one of the things that uh, the author talks about, which I thought was helpful, is sometimes when we're talking about all of those um, levels of racism, it gets to be a little bit um, cloudy uh, a bit. It's a little bit hard to think, okay, so what, what, what can I do and what are we doing and, and what does this word mean versus that word? And so he kind of breaks it down in this way. He talks about racial inequity, which basically means that where two or more racial groups are not standing on equal footing. So, you know, we just talked about some, some uh, disparities around health, but there's disparities around education, there's disparities around wealth, there's disparities around housing, and so there's racial inequity. That's racial inequity. Racial equity is when two or more racial groups are standing on relatively equal footing. So that would be what we're either uh, wanting to do or, or maybe happening in certain situations. Racist policies uh, versus racist um, versus anti-racist policy. So rather than talking about you know the structure, he's talking just about the fact that there are policies that are again advantaging uh, particular races versus others. And so I want to also just describe that uh, as clear as I can for you. So hold on one second while I get that. Uh, and he also talks about racist ideas versus anti-racist ideas. And so a racist policy, again, it is just a, a, a law, it could be written, it could be unwritten, but ways in which um, people are advantaged or disadvantaged. So a policy is any measure that produces or sustains racial inequity between racial groups. So and an anti-racist policy would be any measure that produces or sustains racial equity between racial groups. So when we're talking about the work that we're doing and what we're trying to combat, we're trying to combat the, uh, the continuation of racist policies by having our work be, anti, be rooted in anti-racist policies or in health equity, as it was many times we talk about. And then he also talks about racist ideas versus anti-racist ideas. And so 
he, he, he talks about the racist idea is a way that suggests that one, it, it's an idea that we have that suggests that one racial group is inferior or superior to another racial group in any way. And the, you know, the, the anti-racist idea is the antithesis of that. He talks about the fact, which I think is really interesting too, that there's not a neutral thing. You can't have a neutral idea. It's either going to be something that is in favor of that inequity or in favor of equity. And again, I talked earlier or just a moment ago about you know, internalized racism and that, that happens to people. So I can have racist ideas about people like me, or I can be operating out of racist ideas about how I, again, believe I should show up in the world. So again, he's talking about ideas and policies, and those are the things that you know, I'm gonna continue to talk about when we think about ways to make changes. And so what we've learned from, uh, uh, COVID-19, we also can look at other uh, pandemics. We've dealt with H1N1, what was called swine flu and HIV, and really found that, you know, in places, uh, a lot of my work has been in HIV and found that, you know, when there were, obviously there's never was a vaccine, uh, you know, that for HIV, which I think, again, we're waiting for something like that for COVID-19. But even though we didn't have a vaccine, we have uh, treatment that is, successful and, uh, you know, PrEP, which is antiviral, that helps people so they are not going to be infected with HIV. And there's still significant disparities among people of color, among trans women, among women, among people who don't have a lot of money. So the way in which uh, we're seeing COVID is getting, has been played out before. And so when you look at pandemics and you're thinking about disparities, not only are the things that you just talked about, I think are the reasons, but you look at these categories, whether somebody's going to be exposed to the virus in a more, uh, in, a, in a way that is not uh, equal, whether they're going to, they may be susceptible to trans, I mean, to contracting the virus in a way that is not going to be uh, equal and whether or not they will be able to be treated for that infection or for their, uh, ability to find out about uh, what's going on with them in an unequal way. So there's exposure, there's contracting the virus, and there's treatment. So I'm just going to uh, want you to think a little bit about your groups of people that you're seeing. And I want you to ask this poll. When you think about the clients in your community and you're thinking about their difficulties uh, with um, COVID-19 and thinking about what might make them vulnerable, do you think it's more about their, ex their risk of exposure? Do you think it's about more about their susceptibility to getting the virus due to like maybe living conditions, or do you think it's about access to treatment and um, testing? So I'm launching that poll and I want you to just mark there, what do you think is the, is, is there a particular place where it's even uh, most important in the work that you're doing? Okay, so I'm going to end that, and I'm going to share the results. Uh, and it looks like um, most people said it's about exposure. And I think that you may have said that in some of the um, uh, comments that happened in the group earlier about people having to go to work, people having to uh, not have uh, protective equipment with them, that their exposure to the virus is, um, you know, at a, at a different level than others who have that protection and have maybe the, even the, uh, the luxury of, of being at home and still working. And so, and susceptibility, I think, is another thing. And then access to treatment, it didn't seem as, as much, but it feels like those, those first two were really significant in what you all see in the work that you do. So, um, great, thank you for that. I'm gonna, just talk really briefly about, about these things. So when we talk about exposure and we're talking about systemic racism or we're talking about structural racism, so it, it happened, uh, it's, it's rooted in history, it's rooted in, in, in how things got set up. So in employment, just, these are just some points that I think are, are interesting uh, and make this even uh, more impactful with regard to the disparities that exist. So one in three jobs are held by women uh, are deemed essential. Women of color are more likely to do more essential work than anybody else. Black people or African-American people account for 30% of the licensed and vocational nursing staff. Two thirds of home health workers are women of color. Latina, Latinx, Hispanic uh, 
populations account for 53% of all essential agricultural workers. Many of those people, uh, due to uh, history in the Jim Crow area, don't have paid leave. Um, home health care workers, uh, many of them are not given adequate protective gear because they're the ways that they are represented uh, are, are different than other people in, in health care. Uh, there was a act recently, uh, the Coronavirus Relief Act, that was helping uh, people who uh, may be impacted by the COVID-19, but it didn't cover people who are agricultural workers, people who are undocumented, people who are in home health. So the profile of the, uh, of the home, the essential worker, really um, is indicative of what we're talking about with regard to um, race and uh, racism, really. So, and susceptibility in contracting the virus, um, there's a way in which the um, residential segregation history that's happened over um, decades really created it so that people uh, didn't have access to living in particular places that other people could. And that created uh, a lot of uh, difficulty with regard to um, how people um, were able to either access you know, care and medical treatment and all of that. And that, and that it, when you look at this, uh, housing in racially segregated places are most like, are more likely to have housing violations. Uh, African American and Latinx uh, are twice as likely to lack complete plumbing. Native Americans, 19 times as likely to lack complete pl plumbing. And we're talking about COVID-19, we're talking about people having access to clean water, to uh, bathrooms, to uh, housing situations that would be safe for them to really uh, take all the precautions they need. And I think somebody said this, but many times people are living in multi-generational places or there's more people in their houses, so there's more susceptibility to contacting the virus. When we're thinking about treatment, there's also, um, uh, I think somebody said this already, this is the third one down about the recipients of interpersonal racism from the medical staff and people who are doing the work who have um, implicit bias and some of it's conscious, some of it's unconscious around different people of color and uh, what they need and their ability to, uh, to take uh, medications or withstand pain, all of that. Um, history, there's something called the Hill-Burton Act that happened in 1940s that uh, set up uh, hospital systems kind of all up throughout the, the country, and it was seen at the time as a very um, helpful thing because we were going to uh, have a lot of uh, new uh, healthcare facilities that, that were opening up for everyone. However, it also allowed people to segregate hospitals. And so, especially in the South, there were black hospitals and white hospitals. And so there was, again, an unequal way in which people are treated uh, over time due to things that we just talked about with regard to housing. The proximity of medical facilities uh, to people of color and, and black people uh, were really um, different because uh, people weren't investing in those communities. Hospitals were closing in those communities. And so treatment to this day, you know, is in this place of having uh, a different different picture depending on who you are and where you live. And then there are people who are very concerned with uh, immigration status uh, and how that might impact their ability to get treated or to get tested for COVID-19. And again, that is rooted in some racist history. So I'm going to talk now about a process and an approach called cultural humility. We have trainings on it. Maybe you've been to that training. And I'm gonna ask you uh, what you know about it before I get it. Oops, I'm gonna ask you what you know about it before I get into it. Um, I'm gonna ask you what you know about it before you get into it. And here we go. So here it is, I wanna know this. With the concept of cultural humility, you're very familiar and you use it. You've heard it, but you're not sure how to use it. You're not sure what it means. I've never heard it. Those are your, those are your choices. So I'm very familiar with it. I've heard it, but I'm not sure how to use it. I don't know, not sure I know what it means. I've never heard of it. Right, so good, so yay, I'm so happy. So most of you are very familiar. 
some people have heard of it, they're not sure how to use it. So we're gonna talk about both those things right now. And then I'm gonna have you a chance to really talk to each other a little bit longer this next time. So cultural humility is really a lifelong process where an individual examines their own beliefs, their own cultural identities, their biases, their values, as well as the beliefs and the values and the cultures of others. So it's really a, a, a not a one-way street. It's it, when you're working with people or thinking about people, you're thinking about what, who am I and who are they? Uh, and what do I even know or not know? And this next point is that you're relinquishing the role of an expert to become the student of the client uh, with conviction and explicit expression of that person's potential to be a capable and full partner. So what about this person do I need to know or would help me uh, in, again, helping them to access services, helping them to really mitigate some of the challenges that, that COVID-19 has uh, created. And it has three principles. One of them is lifelong learning and critical self-reflection, which is really about the fact that we are always in a process of learning. I'm, I'm so grateful to even have to do this particular presentation to you because it just has made me really open up my uh, mind to some other new thought, which is just so helpful for me. And then that kind of changes how I see uh, the world and other people. So it really is about uh, understanding that, that cultures is really uh, an expression of someone's self. And the process of learning about individuals is a lifelong endeavor because no two people are the same. Uh, and I think that's important when we're thinking about the work that we're doing and really kind of responding to racism. Um, the next uh, principle is really about recognizing and challenging power imbalances. And really what that means is that you wanna respect uh, that it's essential that we have productive and healthy relationships in the work that we're doing. There's just an inherent hierarchy that already happens as we are the people who are offering the services or asking the questions or trying to create resources or think of resources for people and that those um, that there are many people have mistrust of those power structures that we are many times a part of or represent even if we don't feel that that same way about, about how they might feel about it um, and then institutional accountability is the third and final principle it's really about looking at the entire institution uh, you know if it's the health department the community-based organization that you're working in uh, the particular line of work that you're doing and how are we uh, removing some of those structural barriers um, to really create more equity so that people can do the thing that they wanna do, which is, is to live their, their best life in the way that they know how or the way that they like to. And that, that also takes some self-reflection and critical um, reflection to really think about like, how am I either, again, going back to the concept that I talked about, about racist policies and racist ideas, how am I either complicit, you know, continuing to um, be part of that? Or, and then how can I change that or think about an anti-racist idea or an anti-racist policy that we can make sure that we're supporting in the work that we're doing so that the outcomes can be different. So here's a really uh, nice slide that again, I wanna give credit to Jadon Wright for putting this together, which is really about the correlation between what I just talked about, cultural humility and some of the levels of racism. So lifelong learning and critical self-reflection really have to do with it more of an individual way in which I can look at the racist ideas, I can look at some of the ways in which I might be complicit in racist policies, how did mistrust happen, how are stereotypes formed if for, in, in me and maybe in the people that I'm serving. Um, and that, you know, there are some examples of how that works. And so the example here really is about uh, the fact that when they're looking at uh, doctors who, uh, in a particular study in the American Journal of Public Health, that two thirds of them uh, exhibited racial bias in the patients, you know, so that it's just there. And so the other one is the next principle is about recognizing the challenge, uh, the challenging the power imbalances, uh, in, and for respectful partnerships. And so how am I looking at the balances between the kind of uh, individual way in which um, racist happens and maybe the more institutional way in which it, it gets uh, experienced as well? 
there's just another example of what I think you all knew happened recently uh, in Central Park where a, a woman called the police on a person who was watching birds. She used and wielded the power that she had as, an, as a white woman and also as a person who could uh, get a uh, police force to believe that a, a, a black person would be dangerous just by being a black person. And then uh, institutional accountability, again, is, is really at large, that larger structural level. What are some of the policies that we can really look at to think about changing? Um, to make the experience of our communities more equitable. So I, that's, a, that's a large um, thing to think about, but I think it's important to think about as, as we really want to move this and change the dynamics that I just started explaining with regard to the disparities that are happening. And so I'm going to have you be in one more group, and I'm going to give you a little bit more time this time. And you have some of the handouts with you. And so the question is here is, how are we using, how can we use the principles of cultural humility at, for what I'm saying is anti-racist work? How can we use uh, lifelong learning and critical self-reflection, recognizing and challenging the power imbalances and institutional accountability to respond to the effects that structural racism have on COVID-19? You're gonna have, again, uh, facilitating the group. We're not using Jamboard this time. I just want you to have a conversation about what you can do either as an individual, what you can do as a group to really change the dynamics that are happening and think about the principles that I just spoke about. Um, I'm going to give you, Yadi Yali, you're there. You're with me? Yes, I am. Uh, it's two o'clock. You know, I'm going to give them 12 minutes this time, 12 minutes this time to have a, and really think this through and really be present with each other. This is, this is um, not, I don't know, I think, I think it's, it's intimate work in some ways to really be thinking about your place in this and our place as we are um, a group of, of providers that really care about changing some of these dynamics. And then sometimes we're part of the, the problem in some ways. So I want you to think about that uh, thoughtfully. Again, we have, how many groups? We have six groups or five groups? Five? Yes, five. Okay, five groups, and you can, are you about ready to send them to those groups now? Yes, I am. All right, are you all ready? Yes, have a wonderful conversation. I hope it's really helpful and uh, good for you. Welcome back, everybody. So again, I, I'd like to see in uh, chat just a word or two about what was it like to have the conversation with your group. You had a little bit more time, but this was a little bit bigger of a, of a conversation, I think. So in chat, if anybody can write what it was like to have that conversation. Welcome back, I'm just having you write in chat. Any comments about the conversation that you just had with your groups about using cultural humility as a way to um, respond to the racism that's happening around COVID-19? Hard to find a starting place. I really appreciate people sharing. Great conversation, listening and affirming. Great conversation, real, real and candid. How nice, that's really great. I'm glad you guys got to that place. It's not even easy to do virtually. So thank you for doing that. Thank you for the breakout. I learned from the sharing. Oh good, I'm glad. Listening and affirming. Very honest, humble, calling in and out of ourselves, using our power. How nice and privilege in this to swift, to shift equity. Oh, that's really nice. I love what you just said, Kamal. Thank you so much. Thank you for the breakout. I learned a lot. Listening, great conversation, real and candid. Any other thoughts that anybody wants to say? Any of the, uh, okay, please. Any of the um, people who were um, moderators or facilitators want to say anything about uh, their experiences? You can put yourself off mute and just give us a, a, a couple of sentences about how it went. Yeah, sure. Uh, I love the the insights uh, of our group. I wrote some of it. Um, just a lot of humility. Uh, we're we're all in in a lot of the self reflection, lifelong process mode, and and recognizing that, that a lot of us do hold power in certain ways. Mm -hmm. And how do we use that uh, mm -hmm. uh, to to make equity happen? And and also, uh, um, just really uh, this this mindfulness about um. Uh, giving self determination to the people that we work with, you know, they they may not want to work with us for whatever reason, and and that's okay. And mm -hmm. and uh, and how do we take whiteness out of the middle of where we compare everything else to whether or not that that's correct or not, and 
mm -hmm. uh, seeing seeing culture as a strength, not an obstacle. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, it was was also uh, a big thing. And um, and thank you that uh, that breakout group. You you guys are great. Yay! Yay! Who all's breakout group did it? Anybody else from who was a facilitator who wants to say anything about their group? Anybody from a group who wants to say about the group? <laughs> I can say something. This is John. Um, my group also was awesome. Kowal, you do not have the monopoly on awesome groups. There's <laughs> <laughs> awesomeness all over this place, I'm sure. And we were really talking about like how listening is the base, but then you know when we hear stuff like also like where is the institutional responsibility and how we feel like. Um, you know, some of the people in my group who I shall not name felt like maybe the structures that were there um, might be in opposition to what they're hearing. And like, how do you reconcile that and move that forward? Mm -hmm. um, we were talking a little bit about that, but we got cut off. We didn't get, really get to solutions. But I think that that's a really important question is like, what do you also, when you use your power of privilege or when you listen and you hear and you want to move things forward, what is your... Um, personal, you know, responsibility in that and also mm -hmm. what risk are you taking by engaging in that conversation and mm -hmm. how do you mitigate that? Mm. No, those are really great questions. I feel like we need a we need a part two, three, four of this because <laughs> there's so much to, to consider. It's really a lot. I appreciate the thoughtfulness from the group. Is there anyone else to who wants to was a moderator who wants to say a little bit about it or if anybody who was in a group that wants to say anything about what they got out of it or what they think to the larger group? Hi Kim, it's Jackie. So I think I'll just echo what Jadon said. That's similar, similar things came up in our group. Um, echoing Jadon, my, my group was amazing too. I think they also had questions, you know, around two and three and like what are some tips or, you know, tips or tools that they could put in their toolbox to better recognize challenges of power imbalance. So if you have some, some of those tips or tools, uh, you know, that you could share, that would be, uh, be great as well. Okay, no, thank you. I actually want to think a little bit more about that. And again, if anybody has, if this, is, this is not just to me, but to anybody who's uh, on this call or in their groups, do they have any ideas about ways to really be more uh, I don't know, cognizant of the power imbalances that are happening or, more aware or thoughtful uh, about thinking of the institution? Anything that anybody wants to respond to that question that Jackie just asked? You know, just really quick, uh, I know that a lot of the folks we work with have, have gone through uh, so many years of their life of, of running into a system uh, that that has never believed in them, never really cared for them, has turned their backs on them, mm -hmm. and and what I try to try to do is when when I'm uh, also seen as representing that system, mm -hmm. you know, I'm, I'm really trying to to uh, to to have them have an encounter uh, where it's where it's different, where where uh, hey, this didn't feel like so much of what I was used to or what I thought I was going to expect uh, in this in this encounter, you know, like, uh, mm. um, and, and by, by centering, uh, yeah, their self-determination, uh, validating, uh, their, their journey, um, uh, really, uh, just being in a place where I'm trying to take that power away and really see them, ourselves for, for the strength of, of, from, from ancestors to connection to the land that they live on, that they're, dis that they're disconnected from, even though they're, they came from this land, you know, like, just holding uh, those kinds of things and um, mm. yeah, just wanting them and have a liberating experience versus just another experience against a system that doesn't care. I know that's beautifully stated too. And I think that, you know, when, I, when I'm hearing from some of what you're saying, it's like, it, if, if I'm wanting to aspire to what you just said, what do I need to do or what do I need to be aware of when I'm, you know, in that interchange with somebody so that I can make that more of a liberating experience rather than just another experience. That was really wonderfully stated. Um, again, I'm going to give it uh, another minute or so. If anybody else wants to comment on the conversation that you had, whether you're a facilitator, whether you're a participant, or anybody on the line who wants to say anything about thinking about this work around cultural humility and anti-racism.
If not, you know, um, Yadi, I have a question. Were you able to give the people the uh, other handout that I had? Around? Yes, I sent it to folks this morning. Yeah. So there's just another handout that I thought was interesting. Again, this is from Jadon, so I want to uh, acknowledge that. That was really talking about communication styles and another way in which we can look at how we either, um, I don't know, are complicit or perpetuate the uh, dynamics that happen. You guys talked a little bit about recognizing and challenging the power imbalances, and there's ways in which you know, we show up in the world, you know, as people of color or as people who have uh, privilege in different ways um, that are important to really recognize about, you know, speaking up, speaking down, thinking about how you, what your, you know, the ideas you have. I think it's, it's just a really helpful thing to look at and to think like, how am I um, maybe perpetuating some of that um, hierarchy or what are some ways in which I can, you know, challenge that or change my uh, way in which I might be um, either uh, putting out my privilege or putting out my oppression. And so I think it's really helpful. So I want you to look at that because I think it's something that could be helpful when you're talking about how to how to continue to communicate in your institutions and organizations uh, in a way that um, is also respectful of equity. So we're getting towards the end of this and I wanna make sure that you also know that there's some resources besides uh, the slide that I gave you that talked about some of the authors that I think are important to look at, but you have some other um, bibliography and other things to look at at the AC Care Connect group site. And you can uh, download the slides that I used and the materials and some other, um, other materials that are available for you there. Um, this has been uh, coordinated by the AC Care Connect, and I just want to make sure you know that, and I am a consultant for them. These are upcoming trainings. They, you all do a lot of trainings, and again, uh, Jackie, or, or um, if you want to come in on this, you can, but we have, looks like you have some trainings coming up at the end of July uh, on empathy effect. Uh, yeah. Tim, we're going to do, yeah, please do that. Yeah, so uh, these are just a list of our upcoming trainings for the month of July and August, so you can pretty much see we have quite a few in August. Um, there's also one that's coming up around emergency, emergency medical response services so around EMS, um, which will actually be a pre-recorded training um, that'll be about probably 20 minutes that you'll be able to register for. We haven't listed it on there, but just so you know, it's in progress and will be offered to you either late this month or early August, and then you'll register for the tra these trainings the same way that you registered for Tim's training today um, through our training portal. Um, and then just keep in mind, even if for whatever reason it's full, you get put on the wait list. If someone cancels, then we'll go ahead and move you over. Great. So these are some of them. So join if you can. Um, that would, you know, I'm sure we'd like to see you and they'd like to see you. Um, again, this is my uh, contact if you want to send me a uh, message uh, to my email address about anything, questions or any concerns you have about what we talked about today or things you have in the future. I uh, wanna thank you for your participation. It sounded like the breakout groups were um, helpful to really speak to each other about these issues. And uh, I think it takes more time as, as I think people said, there's more to consider and more to think about and hopefully we'll just continue to have some of these forms in which to do that. Um, I'm so impressed with uh, all of the work that you do. I, I was able to do a lot of live trainings back in the day <laughs> when we did live training. So I do know some of you and some of the work that you're doing and it's just really, really um, inspiring to me. So thank you for everything that you do. And I'm just grateful to have been um, able to present today. So if there's any, anything in closing from the group, from the um, skills development unit that we need to let people know about? Um. Just one last quick comment. You'll, you should receive an evaluation link online. Once you've completed the evaluation, you will receive the PowerPoint and um, a video link for this training. Um, so make sure that you complete the evaluation link if you're interested in getting all the material that was presented today. Okay, and I started this by having you um, show us your faces. <laughs> so I want you to show us your faces and say goodbye to each other and wish each other well. So if you can un open your video, if you haven't opened your video, thank you so much for being here. I wish you all the best. See you. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you, everyone. Thanks so much, thank Tim and Kawal. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Have a good rest of the day.
Thank you. you.